Welcome everyone to our webinar uh, this afternoon. My name is Dennis Ross. I'm a former member of Congress and I'm joined with a very esteemed panel uh, of participants, uh, specifically on the issue of the Rosenwald Schools National Parks campaign. Uh, this is a very informative, very enlightening history. Uh, in fact, a very positive part of American history that we're hopeful that we get the word out, uh, not only in support of the um, Rosenwald uh, National Park uh, project, but also as a lesson that was a very valuable time and effort in local communities, in the African-American communities in the rural South uh, that developed a, a wonderful education, uh, culture, libraries, and, and some very distinguished uh, students that came from there. And to start our program, I would like to recognize Miss Dorothy Cantor to give us a background and discussion of the whole genesis of this project. Uh, Dorothy is... Um, uh, the founder and uh, director of the campaign for the Rosenwald uh, National Park Project. Dorothy, take it over. Thank you very much, Dennis. And many thanks to Harry Boyd for introducing me to you, Dennis, and also to Sharon Davies. And I'm happy to say that Sharon is now a member of the Advisory Council for the Rosenwald Park Campaign. So thank you, Harry, very much. Um, this is the story of two men and nearly 5,000 African-American communities and, and partnerships that they forged to provide education for African-Americans in the segregated South. Today's program also addresses journeys, both of a century ago and those of today's participants. The first man, Booker T. Washington was born enslaved in Southwestern Virginia in 1856 and thirsted for education. He walked across Virginia to reach Hampton Agricultural and Industrial School, where he worked in return for the education he desperately wanted. Becoming highly educated, Washington went on to found Tuskegee Institute, now Tuskegee University, in rural Alabama, and built that institution into a prestigious center for higher education for African-American students. He was nationally known and committed for many years to building schools in the rural South for African-American children. The other man, Julius Rosenwald, was born in Springfield, Illinois in 1862 to German Jewish immigrants who came to the US to escape persecution in Europe and to find a better life, which they did. Rosenwald left high school early to learn the clothing trade in New York. While living a comfortable life, but by no means wealthy, in Chicago, manufacturing men's suits, he got an exceptionally lucky break, a break of a lifetime. This was in 1895. He got the chance to buy into the recently uh, created Sears, Roebuck and Company. Between Richard Sears' amazing marketing skills and Rosenwald's business acumen, Sears Roebuck became the retailing powerhouse of the early 20th century. People today say that it was the Amazon of the 19th, 20th century. Actually, Amazon is the uh, Sears of the 21st century. <laughs> Not that anybody's gonna believe me. Um, <laughs> Rosenwald used his enormous wealth to help others particularly African-Americans to lead a better life. In 1910, Julius Rosenwald read Washington's autobiography, Up From Slavery. Later that year, he offered challenge grants, which was something he did often, of $25,000 to every city in the United States mm -hmm. that raised $75,000 independently to build YMCAs for African-Americans. Keep in mind, African-American men had no place to stay in cities unless they had friends or family in those cities. By 1932, when the program ended, YMCAs had been built in 24 cities, as well as two YWCAs. It may have been those challenge grants that led Booker T. Washington to Chicago in May, 1911. He was looking for a new member for the board of Tuskegee. Rosenwald held a luncheon for him and then the next day took him out to the Sears merchandising facility to show him 
the amazing place that that was. Soon thereafter, uh, Washington offered Rosenwald a place on the Tuskegee board. Being the excellent businessman that he was, Rosenwald um, first visited Tuskegee, renting a railroad car and taking with him his family, his rabbi Emil Hirsch, Jane Adams, with whom he was very friendly, and other friends to visit the campus. Liking what he saw, he became a member of the board in 1911. In August 1912, Rosenwald turned 50. Now, he didn't have a big gala and spend a lot of money on celebrating his birthday. What he did was he pledged a lot of money to a number of charitable organizations, one of which was Tuskegee Institute. Tuskegee received $25,000, which in today's value would be, I believe, over half a million dollars. Washington asked if he could use $2,800 of that amount to build six schools in rural Alabama near Tuskegee as a pilot project. Keep in mind, he'd been trying to build schools for a number of years. Rosenwald agreed, but stipulated that he would give $300 to each community that would raise $300 in land, labor, materials, money, or a combination thereof. The communities quickly agreed to this, even though they were already paying taxes and getting no schools or inadequate schools. The schools were quickly built. The two men became not only partners, but friends. Washington was the one who was much more educated. Rosemald was the one who had all the business skills. Both were practical and pragmatic. Both believed in self-help and results-oriented projects. Each had a wi willingness to listen to and learn from the other. For example, Washington was Rosenwald's mentor on issues affecting African-Americans, advising him often on what to read. In 1914, Rosenwald agreed to provide $30,000 more to build 100 more schools. Unfortunately, in November 1915, Booker T. Washington died unexpectedly. Rosenwald, stirred by Washington's vision and passion, carried on building the schools in partnership with nearly 5,000 African-American communities who thirsted for education for their children. In 1920, when the school building program had become too large, to be handled by Tuskegee. Rosenwald moved it directly under his Rosenwald Fund, Julius Rosenwald Fund, which was created in 1917, and administered it in Nashville. By 1932, when the program, building program was terminated, there were 5,357 schools, teacher homes, <coughs> and top buildings that had been constructed. They, they were in 15 states from Maryland to Florida, from North Carolina to Oklahoma, from Louisiana to Missouri. Nearly one third of African-American children in the South were educated at these schools, approximately 660,000 students. Um, would you mind putting uh, put the, um, Map up, please, Patricia. Uh, the map, you know, that's that's the Rosenwald School on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. There it is. Thank you very much. This shows you the the breadth and scope of the building program, and the most uh, the state with the most schools was North Carolina. The state with the fewest was Missouri, only four were built in Missouri late in the program. Um, so this gives you an idea of just how enormous this program was. Thank you very much. You can take that down now. Um, through his partnerships and challenge grants, Rosenwald contributed to the education of African-Americans at all levels, which enabled them and their descendants to lead a better life 
and enter professions from which, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. But I'll finish that. Uh, from which they had been previously excluded. This contributed to enhancing the nation's democratic values. Um, so I got ahead of my health, but getting back on track. There is more to Julius Rosenwald's philanthropic journey to help African Americans than the Rosenwald schools, even though that is very, very significant in itself. The Julius Rosenwald Fund awarded fellowships to nearly 900 people in over 40 different disciplines from 1928 to 1948 to help them advance their careers. Two thirds of them were African American. They included singer Marian Anderson, authors James Baldwin and Ralph Ellison, diplomat Ralph Bunch, John Hope Franklin, the historian, poet Langston Hughes, artist Jacob Lawrence, photographer Gordon Parks, and psychologist Kenneth and Mamie Phipps Clark. That's just to name a few. The Rosenwald Fund Library Program established more than 10,000 school, college, and public libraries and funded library science programs that trained African-American librarians. The fund also supported HBCUs, including Fisk, Tuskegee, Howard, and Dillard Universities and Morehouse College. It supported early NAACP legal cases that eventually led to the Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka case before the Supreme Court and also contributed to improving the health of African-Americans through more accessible and better hospitals and clinics and enhanced training of African-American doctors, nurses, and midwives. Beyond that, Julius Rosenwald was the founder and first president of the Jewish Federation of Metropolitan Chicago, a member of the board of Jane Addams Hull House for 20 years, and the founding donor of the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. He truly embodied social justice. As I said, through the schools, the fellowship programs and all the rest, he enabled African-Americans to lead a better life and enter professions that previously they had been excluded from. So this brings me to my own personal journey to create a new national park. In September 2015, I saw the documentary Rosenwald by Aviva Kempner. I had never heard of Julius Rosenwald. I am Jewish, but I did know quite a bit about national parks, having served on the board of the National Parks Conservation Association, NPCA, for nine years and having visited more than 300 national park units at that time. I knew that not one unit of the national park system commemorated the life and legacy of a Jewish American, nor the impact of Rosenwald schools. In 2016, representatives from NPCA and the National Trust for Public for Historic Preservation gathered to plot a path forward. The National Trust was key because in 2002, it listed Rosenwald schools as one of the 11 most endangered historic places in the United States. This led to the restoration of numerous schools and restorations are still going on even as we speak. The trust estimates that of the more than 5,000 facilities that were built, about 500 still exist today. From that meeting, the campaign to create the Julius Rosenwald and Rosenwald Schools National Historical Park was founded. The mission of the campaign is to establish a multi-site park with a visitor center in Chicago where Rosenwald lived, worked, and did his philanthropy, and a small number of Rosenwald schools, all of which will be selected by the National Park Service. Legislation was introduced in both houses of Congress in 2019 that received bipartisan support. It called for the National Park Service to perform a special resource study of the sites that are associated with Julius Rosenwald and the Rosenwald schools. The final act passed in December, late December, 2020, overwhelmingly in both houses and became law on January 13th 
2021. In the final law, 10 notable Rosenwald schools that were recommended to the campaign in 2017, of a total of 56, were listed, as well as four sites in the state of Illinois. The National Park Service started the study in April 2022 and expects to complete it by April 2024. To date, 187 nonprofit organizations, both national and local, uh, uh, of a robust and diverse range of constituencies have signed on. And many thanks to Dennis Ross for the uh, support of the American Center for Political Leadership. Um, the campaign became a 501c3 nonprofit corporation in 2019. It has made a lot of progress and is optimistic that a new park unit, whether it's a park or a national monument, will be established in the next year or so. It will fill four significant existing gaps in the North national park system. It will be the first to honor the life and legacy of a Jewish American. It will be the first to address the impact of Rosenwald schools. It will be the first to deal with early African-American Jewish relations, and it will be the first to focus on American philanthropy. I invite you all to join Team Rosenwald and help us create a new national park. Thank you. Thank you again, Dennis. Dorothy, that was fantastic, and I appreciate you laying the foundation for this. Uh, I want to turn it over to uh, Dr. Harry Boyd, who is the, uh, the senior scholar in public work philosophy and co-founder of the Institute of Public Life and Work at Augsburg University. And also, Harry had the unique opportunity uh, being part of the um, civil rights movement uh, with Martin Luther King Jr. And Harry, I'll let you take it from there. Mm, thank you, Dennis. I used to take Dr. King to the airport sometimes played ping pong with him. My dad was on the executive committee. Uh, thank you for, for former members of Congress. This is, seems to me a splendid and a great connection. Let me talk about several dimensions of the, of the movement, the educational movement that are not well known, but I do think need to be in, included in a park. So, uh, certainly in the, in the uh, sites and also the Interpretive Center. Last spring, Nancy Cranick, president, past president of the American Library Association, who I also introduced you to, Dorothy, um, invited me to write a guest essay for Library Quarterly. This proved an opportunity for me to study the little known story of the Rosenwald educational movement. I made some marvelous discoveries. Black communities built, as you said, Dorothy, more than 5,000 schools and 10,000 libraries from 1915 to 1937. I also discovered a network of educators called Gene Supervising Teachers who organized most of the communities which built the schools and libraries. Uh, they also advanced the education of black teachers, uh, built strong relations with HBCUs and filled the curriculum with a deep appreciation for the talents of every black child. Uh, emphasis we need today. Uh, leaders in the civil rights movement like John Lewis, Medgar Evers, Maya Angelou, all went to Rosenwald schools. I wanna highlight three dimensions to the story. The leadership model of Washington and Rosenwald, the outpouring of grassroots energy and interracial work that built and sustained the schools and libraries, and the organizing and educational work of Jean's teachers. Today, people often think of leaders as delivering the goods or telling people what to do. Booker T. Washington and Julius Rosenwald were different kinds of leaders, what I call Ninth Amendment leaders. After the Ninth Amendment to the Bill of Rights, often called the Forgotten Amendment. It reserves rights to the people, not delegated to government, and also implicitly appreciates the potential for citizens, everyday citizens, to take a remarkable action in building the society. 
this is how the Ninth Amendment reads, the enumeration in the constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. The Supreme Court Justice Arthur Goldberg identified these as rights and found in as residing in the traditions and the conscience of our people. There are many traditions, of course, in our own work at the Institute for Public Life and Work. We highlight one especially, the right and capacity of communities to self-organize, coming together to build and sustain things of common value. We call this public work, and schools are a remarkable example. Booker T. Washington strongly believed in such collective and self-directed work, perhaps most especially around education. Today, he is sometimes disparaged in academia for his refraining from overt challenge to segregation, but actually he stood in a long line of black preachers and teachers who used guile and sometimes subterfuge with the goal of building black power and capacity. He argued that open challenges in the South to white supremacy would not accomplish much. This is what he said, the condemnation of wrong should always have a very large and important place in places where it's possible like the North, but a very large place in all of our efforts in the South should be given to something that is constructive. He continued, the way forward for black Southerners is to empower themselves economically, socially, and culturally. Addressing the dismal state of black education was primary. Julius Rosenwald believed in the Jewish concept of justice and responsibility, and he learned from Washington about the dismal state of black education. He also agreed strongly with Washington's philosophy of self-help and collective community action. Rosenwald argued, in fact, that people would not appreciate things just handed to them if they put in work they would feel pride and ownership. The Rosenwald Fund provided, as Dorothy said, one fifth to one third of the cost of building a school and later libraries and plans for school construction. Black communities have the challenge of finding the rest and they more than rose to that challenge. The uh, Rosenwald Fund supported the building of black schools and also beginning in 1927, creation of thousands of libraries in elementary schools and high schools. Well, no, actually the libraries were bung it early in 27 it began in high schools. It supported teacher training and library science programs in historically black colleges and universities. Uh, and it forged relationships with between the black community and uh, black and Jewish community that continued into the civil rights era. Black communities came up with resources for the schools and libraries from church collections, fish fries, bake sales, and in many other ways. They also contributed a great deal of direct labor. S.L. Smith, director of the Rosenwald Fund Southern School Program, saw heroic efforts by communities across South Carolina to build the schools when he was uh, agent of Negro education in South Carolina. He tells the story of one community, Bolivar, South Carolina, without any money to build a school. Largely by free labor, they built, they made, they created 25,000 bricks with a house over them in a kiln. When a severe storm destroyed the kiln and the house and the stacks of bricks, the Bolivar community was not discouraged, but immediately began to raise money for another try. When he left South Af Carolina not long afterwards, it was a beautiful four room school. In fact, Rosenwald schools were constructed according to a design aimed to what Edwin Embry, Rosenwald Fund's president called an example of beauty and cleanliness, which led to general community improvement, <coughs> seen in repaired homes and better sanitation. More than 15,000 white schools were built on the Rosenwald design model. Black communities were able to gain support from the white educational establishment on state and local levels and support from many local whites. I interviewed uh, folks in North Carolina and the Anderson School, both whites and blacks, who told me about that. Uh, this was in significant ways to the tradition of savviness and um, strategy that Washington called for. Jean's teachers did the bulk of the organizing to make this happen. 
the story of the schools is beginning to get national recognition, especially through the parks campaign. After decades of invisibility, the story of the Jean's teachers and their focus on citizenship also needs recognition. In 1906, Anna Jean, a wealthy Quaker woman in Philadelphia, donated money for the purpose of bettering education for Blacks in the South. The board of the Jean's Fund was integrated, by the way. The effort lasted until 1968. Over 2,300 uh, teachers around the South who were especially talented and could supervise other Black teachers served as Jean's teachers. From the beginning, they had a wide community focus on education. They organized to develop whole communities capacity for action and citizenship education through homemaker clubs, cooperatives, canning groups, and many other ways. They also found ways to make the talent in black communities visible to black communities, but especially to whites who had little idea. In Durham County, North Carolina, for example, Joanne Abel, an historian of the teachers in schools, described how Carrie Jordan, Jordan created a countywide commencement beginning in 1924. Thousands of people would come from uh, schools across the county together to celebrate the accomplishments of students, highlighting winners of school competition in arithmetic, singing, dramatization, storytelling, spelling, and grammar, singing songs and having a fair and festival, Coverage in the Durham, Durham, Durham Morning Herald, which I knew well because I went to Duke, went on for days. It showed the white community a far different reality than the stories of crime and poverty it usually featured. Her Rosenwald schools were centers of other kind of capacity building. For instance, as Joanne Abel describes, the rooms were designed so that classroom partitions could be rolled back after the school day and the community could meet. And there she says, without the prying eyes of whites, they could make plans for racial advance and improvement. According to Leila Trahuf Ali, a student at Yale who researched primary sources of the genes teachers all across the South, citizenship education was a central focus of their approach, their pedagogy, their curriculum. Now it's important to note here the meaning of citizenship for black communities. In his forthcoming book, The Darkened Light of Faith, Race, Democracy, and Freedom in African-American Political Thought, political scientist Melvin Rogers describes a dynamic and expansive view of citizenship held by Blacks. He contrasts descriptive with aspirational citizenship. Blacks knew all well the world as it was. The Constitution devalued Black Americans, counting slaves as only three-fifths of all other persons, as Rogers puts it. The attempt to move from description to aspiration highlights the space of contestation and uncertainty that the politically dispossessed occupied. Black leaders articulated transcendent ethical visions of what kind of community America could and ought to be and the virtues needed to realize and sustain that democratic way of life. The doubled quality of the vision allows African-Americans to both realize and fight against today's impression, oppression, but also to appeal to the polity and exclusions, to call their fellows in Langston Hughes' words to the land that never has been yet. Rosenwald and school, schools and libraries were sites for aspirational citizenship. They pushed back forcefully, forcefully against white supremacy. They prepared students to be citizens of their communities and equally agents of change in the segregated South. As True Haftali puts it, citizenship education was pervasive in the schools and encompassed the whole student, including his or her personal life, intellectual attitudes, social activity, and relationship with others. I realized as I researched the story that the Jean's teachers' citizenship education was very much like the citizenship schools I worked in during the civil rights movement as a young man working for Martin Luther King. Andrew Young with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference has called the hundreds of citizenship schools in which blacks developed public leadership, the very foundations of the whole civil rights movement. This is a story that needs to be known. This is a story that needs to be known. Citizenship is most likely, definitely a dimension of the Rosenwald story. We have something of a citizenship crisis today in America, mm. in the land of bitter polarization and acrimony. 
the park needs to include and celebrate this these dimensions of the story. Thank you. Harry, thank you. And I truly appreciate the emphasis on citizenship and how it was so impactful from the Rosenwald schools. Our next presenter, uh, Sharon Davies, uh, not only is Sharon currently the president of the Kettering Foundation, but she's also the daughter of a Rosenwald School graduate. Uh, Sharon, please share with us. Thank you. Uh, we've got you on, you're on mute, I think. Sorry about that, still, still do that. All right, so I, I wanna thank the former members of Congress for hosting this discussion and inviting me to be a part of it. Uh, this is a, a, a project that is deeply personal to me um, as a result of the fact that my father was uh, born in a rural part of South Carolina um, in a small farming community that um, was the recipient of one of the grants that created a, a school in Marion County, South Carolina. The Rosenwald School that was built there was built on a two acre lot. It was a two teacher school. The Rosenwald Fund gave the community there $700. The Black community there contributed an additional $400. Uh, I'm not sure whether that was in cash or labor or materials. Uh, the Black communities did what they could uh, to uh, match the, the gift of Julius Rosenwald. Um, sadly, the white community in, in that community made no contribution to its, its construction. Um, some did, some didn't, um, but based on my research, it was fairly typical in Marion County, South Carolina uh, for white communities to abstain from, from uh, joining into this uh, incredible generosity that created these, these uh, wonderful schools. Um, in total, in Marion County alone, uh, in South Carolina, the Rosenwald Fund gave uh, funding for 23 schools uh, and, uh, and uh, over, over the entire state of South Carolina, uh, 500 schools and, and uh, other buildings were created as a result of the, of the fund. I originally thought that my father's generation was uh, the first generation in my family to attend that school, but uh, my more recent uh, research uh, shows me that the school in Centenary, South Carolina was constructed in 1924 and it was completed in 1925. Um, that means that my father's mother, my grandmother, Isola, who would have been just 10 or 11 years old at the time that it was being built, was able to attend that school in Centenary, South Carolina for the four years of school that she was able to attend school before she um, was, became pregnant and, and had her first child. My father was born in 1932. The two teacher schoolhouse by that point would have been seven years old when he was born. He and each one of his seven brothers and sisters attended the Rosenwald School there. He received a sixth grade education and some of his younger siblings actually received high school diplomas from the Rosenwald School after more grades were, were uh, added over time. So, so, and I also think, you know, uh, that the background context to these schools is, is so important for us to, to remember and thinking about the significance of these schools to, to families like mine. Um, this, was, this was during a time when white Southerners openly opposed education for black children uh, as a threat to their established social and economic hierarchy. Uh, before the Civil War, as all of us know, uh, Blacks were excluded from, from formal schooling, and many of the states prohibited even uh, Blacks from being taught you know, privately uh, to read and write. Uh, and after the war, as Dorothy really uh, uh, mentioned, you know, Southern states refused to appropriate meaningful funds for the creation of, of Black schools, even though they were collecting tax dollars from white families and black families. Um, many of the school boards were, were known to divert um, those funds um, to, from black schools that did exist, and not many of them did, to, to, to white schools. So, so this was significant um, in uh, the history of our, our country. Black families were living at subsistence levels. Uh, and the idea of sending their children to school 
um, when they could have been um, doing other things like uh, working was actually an, a, a sacrifice to, to black families in, in America at that time. Uh, so, so I just want to mention that that context because it, it says a lot, you know, both about the enormous generosity of, of Julius Rosenwald uh, that outlived um, it, uh, Booker T. Washington's life uh, and went on well after his uh, his partnership with Booker T. Washington, uh, and it says so much about the black communities and and their thirst, as as Dorothy said. Uh, for an education. Uh, so the Rosenwald story is deeply personal to me. The education that my grandmother and my father received was definitely not the best education that we could imagine for our children today, but, but they would not have received even that without a Rosenwald school. And I'm certain that their experience attending that school was a part at least of what instilled in them a deep belief in the transformative power of education. So some years later, my, my father um, went into the military. He met my, my mother. My mother was herself a high school graduate. She had been educated largely in Catholic schools in, in upstate New York. They were both, you know, they were both either a high school graduate or, or went as far as sixth grade. So they would be low wage earners themselves for the rest of their lives. Uh, but but they both passed on this strong belief in education to their six children who would all go on to graduate from college as first gen students. Uh, five of them would receive advanced degrees. The sixth um, graduated from a police academy and designed and led the professional certification process for his police force later in his life. So I say all that to, to just be a part of the big story that we're telling here about Julius Rosenwald and his gift. All of us are, uh, my brothers and sisters and I are personally beholden to uh, Julius Rosenwald, Booker T. Washington and their idea to build schools across the South to educate black uh, school children. Uh, and, and now as the, the president of the Kettering Foundation, um, I uh, think very, very hard about philanthropic gifts like uh, Julius Rosenwald's. Um, as I've reflected on his gift, uh, I think it's, I'm hard pressed to think of any gifts, certainly that surpass the impact of his fund on black families in the United States and by extension, really, our larger society. We really can't know the ripple effects of Julius Rosenwald's uh, gift on the social mobility of Black Americans, but what we can conclude reasonably, I think, is that without those 5,000 schools and other buildings that stretched across the South at a time of hostility against uh, educating Black children, that black children would have been left largely uneducated, illiterate, unable to lead lives that education enables us to lead. So to my mind, that points to a profound impact, not just of this, this gift, but the gifts of philanthropy writ large. Uh, and, and also, um, as, a, as a president of a foundation that is focused on strengthening democracy, uh, both in the United States and, um, and across the globe, um, I, I feel um, a real kinship with the kind of gift that was made by Julius Rosenwald. Uh, the Rosenwald schools provided an education to Black children at a time when our nation was still struggling actually to become a full democracy. It was uh, one that, that provided all of its citizens with the chance to participate in this wondrous project of self-governance. Education provides foundations for democratic citizenship and it starts in schools like my dad's school. Uh, it the democracy depends on educated and informed citizens who can embrace the responsibility, really, of engaging with our fellow citizens and our governmental representatives in directing the lives of our communities. Schools produce literate, civic-minded, 
citizens. They nurture an affinity for democracy as a system of, pub, uh, of popular governance. Um, and so, so that's really important at a moment like ours right now when we're reflecting on the threats, uh, threats to democracy here and, and worldwide. Students uh, of, of schools like the school that was created for, for my father give, uh, give kids like my dad uh, a chance to move from low-wage, under-resourced households um, to new levels of, of social and economic mobility. Uh, schools instill in students a sense of responsibility that all of us owe to advance democracy and defend democracy against all of its threats. So, so both you know, personally and professionally, um, I am um, deeply devoted uh, to this campaign uh, and um, want to do all that I can to make both, all members of our society aware of, of this gift and its legacy. I will say too, like Dorothy, I did not know uh, that the school that educated my father was a Rosenwald school until um, very late in, in my life. Uh, and so I, um, I'm, I'm thankful to everyone who is a part of, of this project to make it better known to our, our nation. Sharon, thank you very much. Your, your, your family legacy and the Rosenwald schools really personalizes this and, and makes it even that much more impactful. Uh, I'd now like to, to go to my good friend, former congressional colleague, uh, but still a very close colleague, uh, Congresswoman Donna Edwards. Donna, take it over. Well, um, it's hard to know how to follow that. Thank you so much, uh, Dorothy and Harry and uh, Sharon for your leadership and my friend Dennis Ross for um, bringing this to my attention. You know, at first I thought, what do I have to do with the Rosenwald schools? Um, and like Sharon, I had to do a little history digging. And so the first thing that I want to tell you um, actually begins a long time ago. I was born in Yanceyville, North Carolina in Caswell County. There were four Rosenthal, Rosenwald schools there, um, two of which my mother, her siblings, and my, her cousins, my second cousins, um, all attended. Uh, I did not know that before starting on this. Now, I think all of those schools have been demolished since then, which really tells you what can happen when we don't embrace and preserve our history. And so knowing now my birthplace was the home to this, you know, sort of great um, experiment and investment in education is really special to me. Now, fast forward, um, I'm, I was elected to Congress in Prince George's County uh, in Maryland. I represented Montgomery County, Prince George's County, and Anne Arundel County. Uh, when I count on my hands, I probably represented at least a half dozen Rosenwald schools. I have visited a couple of them. Uh, one is a museum that um, is under the guidance of our uh, park service here in Prince George's County, the Ridgely School. Um, another is, is still um, operational as an elementary school um, here in the county, um, still you know, running strong. Um, and uh, I think here in Prince Rhodes County, there were about 27 um, schools, libraries, training centers that were funded, either built by or funded um, by Julius Rosenwald. And so, and then, you know, a couple of the, the sites preserved in both Montgomery County and Anne Arundel County. Um, as Dennis knows, I spent a lot of time in the national parks and um, you know, I've been a huge advocate for our National Park Service. And when I was a kid, my dad was in the military. My mother had grown up in rural North Carolina. And um, when they got married, they had us children, six of us, in order to go from one duty station to the next duty station, we would drive and we would stop in the um, in the parks. And um, 
in those parks, I never saw myself um, through the park service. It's only been in recent years that the park service has been able to fully embrace um, the history of African Americans and our Latino neighbors and friends and um, the indigenous community reflected in our national parks. And I think that this project is one that takes the National Park Service to yet another level in terms of both embracing the education and history of Black people in this country and seeing ourselves reflected in the beauty of the National Park Service. And so I'm just really excited to even just play this very, very tiny role. Although, um, Sharon, I travel in philanthropy as well. And so now I'm looking forward to figuring out how I can use my travels in philanthropy um, to support this effort. And to make sure that when that report is finished in 2024, that it then receives the funding and support that it deserves from the Congress. And I think that might be where Dennis and I can come in and other former members as well, because you know, if you think about the breadth of the Rosenwald schools and legacy that it is huge and it spans red states and blue states and you know all of the rest and so i think that there could be a real opportunity here to pull people together um in a way that's so needed right now and so i really appreciate just being a part of this program today uh, Donna, thank you. And, and, and to her credit, too, she has visited probably every national park out there. Uh, and, and I'm very impressed with her passion for the natural uh, and, and the, natu the natural resources that our natural parks continue to preserve and do so well. Uh, we've got some time for a few questions. And, and I'd like to, to, to go to you, Dorothy, first of all, because uh, you have uh, one. You spoke briefly about the documentary that inspired you about this. And we had somebody on the chat want to know the name of that documentary and how they could uh, locate it for their own viewing. Do you know? Yes, well, the documentary is called Rosenwald. It was um, made by a local DC filmmaker, Aviva Kempner. Um, you have to get it from Aviva. Uh, her foundation is the Chess Flick Foundation, C-I-E-S-L-A. <laughs> that was her mother's maiden name. I'm sorry, it's not available on Amazon, whatever but you can get it through Aviva Kempner. Um, it's a 90 minute documentary and she has extra um, pieces that are beyond what was seen in the movie theaters. Also, um, it's available for groups if they wanna show it, uh, you know, like in, in churches or community centers or that sort of thing. Fantastic. Uh, while we have the people uh, still hanging on with us, because I, I think that the, the, the synergy is starting to develop with your efforts at, uh, since 2015, H how best can people help to, to, to make this a reality, this National Park for Rosenwald Schools a reality? Well, they can, um, they can join our mailing list. They can write to me, Dorothy Cantor, D-O-R-O-T-H-Y-C-A-N. T-E-R at rosenwaldpark.org <laughs> and join our mailing list. If they're so inclined, they can donate. One big way they can help is, and I think that Representative Edwards will concur with this, that the more organizations that support creating the park, the more attention Congress will pay to doing this. Um, so we're up at to 187, if we can get to 200. Um, I, if you'll write to me, I'll give you the list of 187 organizations, um, you know, anything from National Parks Conservation Association, Southern Poverty Law Center, Trust for Public Land, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and just contact me and help work on this. Um, Excellent. We're doing webinars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, so. you are. And I, and I appreciate you taking time to do this one. Uh, Harry, you talk so 
talked so well about citizenship, which is at the heart of what both Donna and I have been advocates for, especially in our work with the former members of Congress. In your research of Rosenwald schools and their impact on, on uh, the building of citizenship and civic muscle, uh, I, I think you've also found connections with the civil rights movement. Could you expound on that a little bit and tell us how the two are connected uh, and, and in fact influence the civil rights movement? Oh, we got you on mute. You're on mute. Um, concepts like democracy and citizenship have shrunk. It's part of our problem. Um, so democracy is seen simply in many cases and by the media as voting. Um, citizenship is seen as um, voting and being a law-abiding citizen and doing good deeds off, off hours. But the Rosenwald story is a story of a much larger understanding of citizenship and the work of democracy. These were all democracy schools. These were all preparing, as Sharon was saying, these prepared students to be citizens of their community and equally to be agents of change. That was the, that was the dual mission of the genes teachers. They knew they were taking on a, a pernicious system of racial superiority and white supremacy. Uh, and they also wanted students to be responsible contributors to their own communities. So that also the genes teachers were a particular kind of educator who had a broad, large vision of education. Um, I think, well, academically, although uh, it should be noticed that the Federal Reserve found that the gene schools had significantly lessened the gap between white and black by the end of the Second World War. Huge impact. Um, but academically, they didn't have the. But I think in many other ways, the students developed a sense of responsibility and connection to the community. The teachers were always bringing them out into the community. They were showing uh, possibilities for work that was contributing to the life of the places. So there's a there's a kind of a a lesson in these schools and libraries for what it means to be citizens, and the fact that citizen is not simply off hours volunteerism and voting. It's actually being a citizen through your work and through your profession. Um, and then that certainly carried over in the civil rights movement. Um, now, again, I was worked in the citizenship schools of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. There were 900 citizenship schools. Um, they developed people's public leadership and uh, civic skills. Um, I have the curriculum for the citizenship schools on my shelf. And when I read about what the genes teachers taught, and what they advocated teaching, there are just, it's a through line. Uh, the citizenship schools built directly on the Rosenwald schools. And the citizenship schools were tremendously powerful foundation of the movement, as Andy Young said. He called it the foundation of the whole movement in the preface to Dorothy Cotton's book on the citizenship schools. Um, mm. So I think, I think the, the connections are clear. And then the other thing is that Everyone in the movement I knew, all my leaders, all my mentors, saw democracy as a way of life, not simply a set of formal institutions. That was a culture of engagement. Um, and it involved developing the attitudes and the skills of being an equal and a participant, uh, respecting others of different backgrounds and different ideas. So um, that was also the philosophy of the Rosenwalds, because they really stressed of different ways of knowing different points of view. You know, a lot of the things we've lost today in many places. So yes. the, the connections are clear. Thank you, Harry. Uh, uh, Sharon, I'll, I'll go to you real quickly. You know, one of the things that um, uh, the Kettering Foundation has been very strong, in fact, the, their, their primary mission is about strengthening democracy. Your predecessor, David Matthews, wrote a wonderful book about that. Uh, this whole story of the Rosenwald schools could not have happened without a philanthropic um, uh, institution uh, in, in the form of, of Julius Rosenwald. What do, do, do you think there are lessons today? How can we uh, take the, that, that part of the puzzle, the, phil, phil, the actual necessary part of the puzzle, the philanthropic part, uh, and, and, and expand that in today's world to help create these types of replicate a, a Rosenwald type program? I mean, this, this won't happen through a government organization. Uh, the, the, granted, the National Park will, but the, the legacy that the Rosenwald schools can, can provide can only survive through philanthropic and, and community uh, partnerships. So 
Uh, how would you feel, or what, what, what are your comments about the, the philanthropic uh, aspect of, of continuing this type of um, mission? Yeah, so the way that I, I think about this for myself is uh, we all think about, you know, what can we do in our, a single life, right? Single individual in our lifetime. Uh, and um, sometimes we, we, we think that we actually can't do that much uh, in a world full of challenges. Uh, but I think, you know, the Rosenwald uh, gift is, uh, or gifts, uh, you know, really uh, show us what a single individual who makes a decision, you know, has actually the power to change the lives of people who he will never meet in his lifetime, right? Uh, who come from very different backgrounds, racial, economic backgrounds from him. And yet this is a gift that uh, that I think, you know, keeps on giving so so much so that we we've forgotten even what where it where it began. Another thing I, I'm not sure that we we focus too much uh, enough on is that Julius Rosenwald really didn't want uh, this to be a story about him. And so he, uh, he he decided that uh, the fund had to be spent within 25 years of of his death, and I think you know it really just uh, says a lot about him, but also is a part of the reason why we don't remember this extraordinary yeah. gift, and and we and, and we really should remember it because it's inspirational, uh, and we need to be inspired by the best Amen. of our, our our role models. And he was one of America's best. So, so, uh, so you know, I I do think that um, these kinds of generous acts in philanthropy can bring out the best in others who know about it. And so that's why I'm I'm deeply uh, uh, well connected to um, this campaign and and hopeful that more people will will learn about it. Thank you, Sharon. And Donna, Donna to, to you, because you and I lived it, the world sees it, the polarization and the partisan world. Are there lessons to be learned from Rosenwald that might be able to help us heal some of our partisan divide? Well, I, I do think that this notion of, um, you know, investing in communities that don't look like you um, is really powerful. And and it says a lot about how we need to connect with people who aren't us. I mean, Dennis, the two of us have experienced it. So you go out yeah. in the country, and I certainly learned this as a military brat, that, um, you know, where you have to live in, in communities and figure out ways to communicate with each other. And I think the Rosenwald schools and the the legacy is one of the is you know sort of one of those foundations where people learn that you have to live in a larger world and communicate in a larger world and um, and so to me those are, are are important lessons. I also think the importance of embracing us. I mean, we look at this you know panel here and you know, embracing the idea that we can make investments in each other and that we can learn from our history. I mean, there's been, you know, especially over these last um, several months, such an attack on just the idea of history. And the Rosenwald schools are a reminder that if you don't work to preserve your history and to continue to tell your story, then it will be lost. And so this campaign is about not losing our history. That's wonderful. Uh, we, we didn't have a chance to, to get to all the questions in the chat, uh, but I do want to thank uh, our panelists, uh, Dorothy Cantor, Harry Boyd, Sharon Davies, and Congresswoman Donna Edwards. Uh, the, the, and of course, the former members of Congress for sponsoring this. This is a, a campaign that I hope to see successful and, and replicated uh, throughout the country in terms of the impact that it has on citizenship education, on cultural advancement, and bringing a nation back together again. So I thank you all for participating, and I 
also thank those who have uh, joined us to, to observe and, and to uh, participate. We'll try to get to your questions through the chat right after this. So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.